All right. Um, well, today um, we're going to talk to you a little bit about mental health and wellness at AU and some of the challenges that students are facing. Um, and we're going to kind of break it down in two different ways. We're going to talk about some trends that were happening prior to the pandemic and then some of the initial trends that are coming out after the pandemic. Um, and it, I think it gives a good overview of what we're seeing at the university. Um, but before we get started, uh, we should probably introduce ourselves. So uh, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Volkman, Jeff, and I'm the executive director at the Center for Wellbeing, Programming and Psychological Services. Sorry, it's over a year, but I'm still getting used to the long name, um, formerly the Counseling Center. And I'm here with Dr. Williams. Hello, all. I'm Shatina Williams, and I am the director of clinical services. Yeah, and, and just to understand like how we work together, Shatina and I have worked together for almost six years now. Um, Shatina does a lot of work with the clinical system, so the day-to-day -day management of like what the student experience is when they come to the Center for Psychological Services. And um, I work closely with Shatina, but I work a little bit more on the broader vision of the Center and how we approach wellness and how we think about wellness for the entire student population. So um, I, I based this, well, we've, we've sorry. Um, we've sort of based this presentation off of like Gen Z trends, but also it sort of dovetails um, when the iPhone came out. Um, and so like a lot of times Gen Z is called the uh, I generation. There, there's a book on this that um, actually is pretty interesting. But there's, a, there's um, some really interesting data that we're going to go through um, from some longitudinal studies to show just how different um, this generation is from previous generations and um, hopefully kind of understand what students are presenting with today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how we manage it in the center, but more this is like a broad overview of the challenges students um, generally experience. So this is for students, you know, generally born between 1995 and 2012. Um, seems like a very short time ago for me, uh, given where I am in my life. But, um, uh, and um, we're, we're gonna talk, like this is the first generation that had smartphones accessible all the time. And um, that's, I think, pretty different for at least some of us in the room that, uh, you know, started out maybe when the internet was, was still a thing. And, and then, um, you know, laptops and Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, like all these things that we experienced um, real time, these have always been there for the generation of students that we're currently working with. So um, this is just to go over some of the uh, information. This, this information was collected from a number of different studies, um, the Monitoring the Future uh, of 12th Graders. That's a study that's been going on from 1976 um, to the present, and then 8th and 10th graders since 1991. There's a youth, youth risk behavior surveillance system that's been in high school since 1991. American freshman survey students entering four-year institutions of colleges since 1966. The generational social survey, 18 plus since 1972. And the Center for Collegiate Mental Health, um, CCMH, which is a center that American University is a part of. Uh, and it's basically a, a, it's run out of the University of Michigan, but it's a it's a uh, group of universities that pull information together to understand mental health trends and, and treatment outcomes for students. Um, so it's this very, very large database. And it's really a, how we how we determine a lot of what we do at the center is through the research done through the organization that we're a part of. So one of one of the interesting things, I'm sorry if this is a little small, but like one of the interesting things that we see with um, the generation that we're currently working with is a slower de de development. And that's something that's really different from previous generations. So um, if you look at um, the the solid line is getting a driver's license. And I remember when I was when I was growing up getting a driver's license, I was like, I got to get this as fast as possible um, so I can go places. Um, it's a much, it's, it, people are much more less likely to get a driver's license quickly um, today. Um, another piece that we'll talk about more in more detail is work for pay. Um, uh, this generation is much less likely to have experience working for pay. Um, and that will, that's controlled for socioeconomic status, gender, and ethnicity. Um, we'll, we'll kind of break that down again a little later. Um, ever gone on a date? Uh, ever tried alcohol. Um, for a lot of students that are coming here today, these are going to be their first experiences with this. Um, and 
you know, when we when we think about, um, there was a study done that's not on here, but it was done in the it was done recently, and it talked about the student development, and it basically made the case that like the average student, college student in the '90s, that the 18 year old would be like a, um, or an 18 year old today would be like a 14 year old in the '90s in terms of individuation and uh, development. So it it, it their students are in a, a really different place. Um, face to face interactions. I think this is a fascinating one, and and you can see the advent of the iPhone. But students today have much less face to face interactions prior to coming to university. Um, and I keep talking, jumping ahead, but you know we'll talk about how this impacts students. But also, like if you think about combining this with the pandemic, so students were already having very little face to face contact. And then for the first time, they're they're meeting with people in person. They're having to navigate roommate issues, and this is a real challenge because basically there's there's less practice at it, right? Um, and uh, <clears throat> I think we've seen that in terms of how students like to interact with us. Um, you know, one of the things that we hear often at our center um, is that we don't want to have to talk to someone to make an appointment. We want to be able to make it online. We don't want to have an interaction. Um, we want to be able to cancel an appointment without having to call. Uh, and so these are the realities kind of that students are coming in with. And it's up to us to decide how much we want to adjust, how much we want to try to work with students to bring them forward in terms of their development. But it's a it's a different type of challenge, I think, than previous generations have had at university. OK, um, also, like, so. I think it's really fascinating. The loneliness has gone up tremendously since the advent of the iPhone. If you look here, um, this is when the iPhone was released, and this is how often you feel lonely or left out. And if you look at how much it skyrockets um, after social media becomes present all the time, it's it's quite high. And you know, I was I've I've been reading a lot about loneliness in college students, and basically, this is the loneliest generation that has existed that we have data for. And I find that really interesting because, you know, everything that we're told is there are more ways to connect than ever. Um, you know, dating apps, social media, all of these things that have been built in to help us connect have actually had an adverse effect on students and made them more lonely and feeling more left out. I am a millennial. So, um, when I was growing up in the summertime, I would go outside, go to the park all day and just make it home before the street lights came on. This generation is very different. Me growing up, there were like three seminal events. There was Rodney King, there was 9-11, and then college, there was Hurricane Katrina. This generation of students is exposed to so much more and not just morning news or late night news, but constantly at their fingertips. And so they're exposed to a lot of danger. Um, and they have a lot of safety precautions in place. So things like air tags, location sharing, things of that sort, a cell phone where parents or a loved one can constantly reach them. So in general, um, they're more concerned with physical and emotional safety, and they're less likely to take really uh, big risks in life. This is on the left side, eighth graders on the right side, 10th graders. And this is how they are spending their time. And I know this is a little small. So uh, like uh, Dr. Volkman said, they're spending less time um, engaging in a lot of different activities. So less likely to engage in religious activities, working sports, um, less likely to engage in print media. That's no surprise, uh, but more likely to engage in homework, social networking, TV, anything related to the internet they're connected to it and things outside of the internet um, less connected to it. They're also a generation that feels less competent and feels less liked. And that's no surprise when you think about social comparison. They're exposed to people like um, Greta Thunberg, the, Greta Thunberg, um, who is doing a lot. And you, so you're looking at yourself like, well, what am I doing? Am I active enough? Am I doing enough? Am I engaging enough in the world? Um, and so they're looking at that and they're comparing, comparing themselves to a lot of different people. 
in terms of grades, remember when a 4.0 or a perfect SAT score was like such an anomaly, like it never happens, this person is in the news because how did they do that? Um, now it is so much more common for students to graduate with 4.0s or above, uh, which was very rare, and to have perfect SAT scores. So what does that mean for us? It means when they're not doing well academically, they have a different expectation for themselves. They're expecting to excel, and by excel, they mean getting all A's, B's, C's, unacceptable. Um, you know, when I was in school, it's like, C's get degrees, them, no, they're like, I'm failing in life. Um, their political views are also uh, changing. They're less likely to be middle of the road, less likely to be conservative. So liberalism is on the rise for them. Um, I think we, we see that a lot, no surprise. Um, they are more likely to be for abortion, more likely to be for um, gun permits, gun permits, not guns, gun permits, um, opposed to a death penalty and believe that marijuana should be legal. I don't think that's much of a surprise there. Uh, and if, if I could just jump in, um, one thing that I think is kind of interesting about this slide and, and the political views is that a lot of the political decisions have gone against the views of, of the generation. And so I think there's a high degree of like, frustration and helplessness. And we also know this generation is the most, like they vote more than any previous generation at a younger age. Um, but it, when we look at the outcomes that they've experienced, they've experienced some hard outcomes in terms of their, their political beliefs. And so I feel personally like it's created sometimes a sense of helplessness or, or a lack of agency. And um, that lack of agency, I think comes out in a lot of different ways, but it, it certainly doesn't build self-esteem. Um, what's kind of interesting also as we talk about this generation is how they think about themselves. Um, in general, uh, this generation thinks of themselves as the greatest generation. Um, and, uh, you know, when you look at all these different categories, it, it's straight up. So it's like, it's this weird sort of, weird is probably not a good word that a psychologist uses, but it's, it's this, um, it's this interesting phenomenon, right? Where you're like, I don't like myself at all, but I'm also a part of this really great generation that's doing a lot of good things, but I don't feel good about myself. And, and you know, when Shatina was talking about who you're comparing yourself to, um, we, we have sort of idolized certain people that were, are very successful at a young age in, this, in our society, and that's what students see. And so I think it's particularly poignant at AU when we think about change makers, like change makers, that's their goal. And um, if they're not achieving their goal, then they're, they're going to be working towards it um, in, in a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's going to be productive. Sometimes it might be less productive. Um, but that's their hope. And, and they want to live up to the expectations they feel like the generation has for them. Uh, another interesting thing is um, uh, how religious commitment has declined over time. Uh, this is the least religious affiliated um, uh, generation that there's ever been. Um, and you could see like the, the really steep decline. Uh, and it, there's, there's lots of different reasons for this, but also generally like religion, um, you know, this is dependent on views, but is a protective factor for students. It, it sometimes helps build community and self-esteem and that, and it's, it's another area that is, um, not there, uh, in the same way it was maybe in previous generations. Obviously not for everyone. Uh, I, I thought this one was interesting, um, going out without parents. Um, uh, so I am Gen X, so a little bit um, older than Justina. Uh, but I remember when I could not wait to go out without my parents. Um, and you know, they're great, they're, they were great parents, but I wanted to like be with my friends. I wanted to explore. I was like, when I got dropped off at college, I was like, okay, good. To this was great. Uh, I'll see you all later. <laughs> you know, um, this generation has very little experience of going out without um, their parents. They generally go out two times a week, maybe without parents. Um, parents are tend to be involved in all of their extracurricular activities. Uh, it's much more likely, like if they're going to have a social gathering, that it's in a parent home rather than uh, where, where parents are involved. So when they arrive at university, um, and I'm sure we've all had, or I don't want to say speak for everyone, but we've had parent phone calls. Um, 
that are asking for certain supports that we can't provide, but this is the level of support that they've received throughout their development. Um, and when we think about the pandemic, I mean, at that stage, no one was going out without their family, right? Like you were in, in your bubble generally. So there's just not a lot of experience with exploration and the building of social connectivity. And I, I think that that's had a profound impact on um, development. Oh, uh, and this is just control for socioeconomic status to show that like across the board, um, it, 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 it's been a big drop as well as, um, well, and then we, we can look at um, time spent on homework. So I, I find this also fascinating. I think we often hear about students who are like, I spend so many hours on homework. Um, and, and yes, they do spend a lot of hours on homework, but when you compare it to um, other generations, it's not significantly more than like Gen X was spending on homework. And I think sometimes our, our empathy lens is sort of challenged in these situations because we're hearing students say like, all I, I study so much, I study, you know, two hours a night and I still didn't get an A. And then we can reflect back and say like, well, yeah, I feel like I studied two hours a night and I didn't get an A. Like that, that's kind of how things go. But, but the expectations for grades is so high that it, it's not meeting. Whereas like it, Maybe when I was at university, if I studied for two hours and I had my friends who studied for two hours, none of us got A's and that was that was okay because you kind of fit in with the norm. Uh, I also think this is interesting. Well, one of the big factors that builds self-esteem for people at a young age is earning your own money and and it kind of provides agency and independence. and And this generation tends to be the generation that has like least been able to earn their own money for a lot of reasons. It's it's not necessarily because they don't want to work. It's because there's the rise of the unpaid internship, right? Um, and there's this pressure that that students have at a really young age to do things that will help them get into university. And you know, when I was um, developing, I worked at a restaurant. I was a dishwasher and a fry cook. Um, that probably helped me grow as a person probably didn't help me get into college, like on my college essay, if I wrote that, right? Um, and so I think, I think that uh, this, this dependence on family for money and not being able to earn your own money has, has lowered a lot of the self-worth that students are coming in with. And that is directly linked to this concept of individualism. So this graph is looking at individualism versus collectivism and the range at which individualism and collectivism impacts quote unquote mature, maturity, familial maturity. And so I'm not saying maturity overall, um, the desire to engage in, in having families of your own, being married, things of that sort. So the more individualistic a culture, the less likely that becomes such a prominent feature. How does this relate to us? Is that work um, and education becomes more of a priority. So in the US, we're much more individualistic culture. So the importance that's placed on doing well academically, getting that internship, getting that job becomes an even greater priority, sometimes over building relationships and connections. Fighting with parents, this is a good one for Jeff. Um, they're less likely to, to fight with their parents. That, um, that adolescent uh, typical rebellion where you're fighting with your parents, that's pretty normal and expected, less likely in this generation, at least not in the ways that we've become accustomed to seeing it, this generation, very different. Sorry, I have to look at my notes. Um, understanding mental health trends. Um, so these students are more likely to have sought professional um, support services earlier in life and more likely to engage in it when coming to college. So um, over, and I'm going to read this exactly from 2015 to 2020, over five years, counseling center utilization increased by an average of 30 to 40 percent, while enrollment increased by only 5 percent. So this means that there is a greater demand of services and students have a greater idea of what they want in terms of services. Um, so needless to say, we are being utilized a lot more than we used to. Um, this graph, a little difficult to see, um, but it is, is showing the, the 
ways in which certain mental health concerns have increased over the course of time. So that very top light green line, that's anxiety. And right under that is depression. Those are the two that I want to highlight. Those are significantly increasing in our, our, our young people today. Other things like uh, alcoholism is going down, but other things are pretty steady, um, such as stress, um, family discord, mood instability, and things like that. In terms of treatment, this, okay, you can see it, maybe not, I'll explain it. So on the left side is average number of sessions a student has in, in higher education. So this is the national survey um, for the collegiate, Center for Collegiate Mental Health. And so it's looking at the average number of sessions that is to the left, and then the percent at which those clinical concerns are utilizing um, mental health services. So for example, 2.8 sessions for legal and judicial concerns on the bottom right here, 10.6 at the top four for gender identity concerns. However, you can see 18.8% um, of the utilization in college counseling centers is for anxiety um, and 20, sorry, that's for depression and 23.3% is for anxiety. So needless to say, depression and anxiety, that's what a lot of students are coming in for. And that is what our services are being used or, or is, is treating more often. Um, they're slowly engaging greater utilization of professional services. Um, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. So not just counseling, but medications, hospitalizations is actually going down. And in fact, actually hospital-based programs are going down in general. So I'm curious about what that looks like um, or to, to tease that apart just a little bit more. It, and so you also see like, um, uh, well, this is kind of to explain a little bit of our, our treatment model. Wait, did we severity? Um, just, just a trend in terms of like self-injury and serious SI, as you see like that, um, continued to go up. This is, this is prior to the pandemic data of what we're sharing right now. Um, but it, it hasn't really, these trends haven't really changed. So, um, when we think about like cutting, this is something that, you know, right now is around 30% of students, um, that we're seeing, uh, experience cutting behaviors, um, SI has kind of fluctuated for us at AU between 35 and 40 percent um, for the past few years now. So it's it's a really like there's some really concerning behaviors that are going on um, in this generation. And again, this is kind of prior to the pandemic, but it 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 it, it fits with like what we're seeing um, now. Um, this is a really interesting slide because I think we hear at our center a lot about our model and a lot about how there are not enough sessions for students. And, and um, I, I try, whenever I hear this, I try to let people know that our, our model is actually based on a lot of data and, um, and also based on the amount of clinicians we have, right? Like there is no possible way to have enough clinicians to meet everyone's extended therapy needs at a university, um, unless we became like a, a therapeutic boarding school, but I don't, I don't think that's the direction we're headed. Um, and I don't know, I mean, anyone who's tried to find a therapist in the community the past four or five years, like it is almost impossible. Like it, there is such demand and DC is, um, there's a really high demand for therapists. So everything is kind of exacerbated. This is, this is treatment length. Um, this is treatment effect for, overall distress, like what students, what, what, how, basically how much students improve when they come in and as average session length. So if we look here, um, students who work with us get about nine sessions, they get an IC and, uh, which is initial intake and then eight sessions of therapy. And if you look at that marker there, the average outcome for eight, nine sessions is very similar to the average outcome for 21 sessions. So there, the dosage that students are receiving is actually very effective for most of what we see. Um, I don't want to. I we could, we have our we have student improvement compared to all other universities, and this year for anxiety, which is the number one thing we see, we were in terms of student improvement, we were in the 99th percentile for how much students improved uh, during a course of treatment. Meaning that like AU students are improving more than 99 percent of students at other universities. Now, of course, that's an average. Um, and you know, I just want to also mention that I don't see any students right now, so it was all the clinicians, not me. Um, but I also think that like there's a it's an interesting narrative, right? Like 
I, I feel like there's there's a scarcity aspect to it that um, students often feel like there's not enough of something, but also what they are receiving is very effective for for often for what they're coming in with. Um, so just some some post pandemic trends. Um, uh, for the first time ever um, in the history of like the CCMH, social anxiety symptoms have outpaced generalized anxiety symptoms. So this is the most socially anxious group of, of students that we've, we've ever seen. Um, and uh, it is now the number one thing at our center that students present with is social anxiety. And I think we can talk, we can think about how that impacts um, students like in all of our work, when we're thinking about students in the dorm, when we're thinking about how students interact with us, like if social anxiety is really high, maybe they're not opening that email because they're social, there's an anxiety attached to it. You know, maybe they're not um, having a face-to-face -face interaction with the professor because they're anxious and they're just walking out of the room and then sending an email later on because that's a lot safer when you're socially anxious. Like there's, there's lots of implications for this. Um, and we know when students have high social anxiety, they're less likely to build community. And I think community is something that we've seen at AU is, is there's room for growth. Um, and, and that's because of a lot of different factors. Um, interpersonal conflict is higher than ever. We, 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 we measure how much interpersonal conflict students have with other students, and we've seen a higher level of that than ever before. Um, you know, I mean, it's been, I'm sure, uh, resident coordinators, people from resident life have seen this as well, but it's been really hard to navigate, um, students who are having conflict with a roommate. And there's been more requests, at least through our office for students wanting to live in a single room that I've than we've ever experienced before. Uh, and then there, there are some interesting parts of the pandemic that I think are really acute for certain students, but but not for the majority. And I, I want to make sure we pay attention to that because we have a, a lot of at-risk populations. So we know that for some students, um, the pandemic was hard, but they didn't experience direct loss. We also know that there are some students that we've worked with very closely who have experienced a lot of direct grief and loss, and it's been very painful. Um, Financial concerns, another one where, you know, for there are certain people in society that did very well financially during the pandemic, but there's also certain people that lost a lot and lost everything. And, and generally those are our, our, our student populations that are less financially secure to begin with. And it's so that that impact has been challenging, I think, for students, but it's also not a trend that they share with with all other students. And so I think that's it leads to further isolation and, and less community building. Um, I. I think uh, there's been a, the number one increase after social anxiety has been students reporting trauma. And um, if we think about the different types of traumas that students experience, I think racial trauma is very high up there amongst what students are reporting uh, over the past two, three years, you know, as the pandemic sort of winded down. And I think that that some of that information kind of speaks for itself with, in terms of what students experienced um, and what society has, has, has occurred in society during that time period. Um, and uh, academic concerns, I think students feel more pressure than ever to succeed academically, to get a good job. And um, I think that that's been, you know, we see that a lot at AU. What's kind of interesting is the academic concerns with a AU tend not to be any higher than any other institutions. So this is, this is just tends to be a generation that has a lot of concerns about their academic um, progress. And then the last thing, which I, I, I feel like is was interesting for me, is just previous therapy experience. So this past year, and this was this was a clinical sample and a non-clinical sample at AU, 70% um, of students reported previous therapy experience um, of first year students. And if you think about that, like, you know, when, when I started, it was probably like 20% of students. So there's like a really high expectations of what that have already been said about what therapy is and um, what what you should receive from therapy. When when I was starting out, I would work with students and it would be their first therapy experience and they'd be like, this is amazing, I've never talked to anyone before. Now we often see students that have talked to people since they were 13, 14 weekly, and they're like, oh, eight sessions, like what is eight sessions? Like I'm used to seeing the same person every week to talk through these issues. Like it, it's more of a part of the wellness routine rather than like a clinical dosage. Uh, for many students. So uh, I think that's that's kind of interesting data for uh, us and for others at the university about like what students are experiencing today. So that is the majority, that is our presentation, not the majority. <laughs> um,
But we have a couple minutes if anyone has questions or discussion points they'd like to ask us or bring up. Hello, Rebecca Little. I'm in the ASAC. Um, I am in school right now for my doctorate, and we talk a lot about instructional design and teaching practices and things like that. So you shared some new information for me, um, just understanding the exposure to technology and everything with our incoming students. I'm curious if you have um, any kind of perspective or any thoughts on schools, especially in secondary school, incorporating technology into their learning curriculums, like iPad learning and, and things like that? And if you believe there's any connection to their mental well being post graduation, when maybe those aren't the primary like tools in their curriculum? I could answer that. I mean, they, it, it, there was, there's similar information. Um, uh, about this with in terms of students expectations for for faculty and professors at school and uh, this generation tends to um, expect more like infographics like videos they are less likely to be accepting of just lectures and um, and so it, it's almost like um, a higher level of entertainment is expected as part of the learning experience and it is a it is a giant shift uh, for students when they leave university to um, go out into the real world and and realize that like they're not going to be quite attended to the same way depending on where they work. Obviously, there there are going to be differences there, and there there are individual differences among students as well. Yeah, I have I have one. Mark Hayes from AU Abroad. Um, when you're talking about the clinical outcomes, like the, the idea that you know you're reducing anxiety. Uh, for this, how are you measuring and how do you know that that's actually happening? Like, what is the, uh, like the measurable for that? Yeah, a great question. So, so we do a clinical a scale of like clinical symptomology and we do a re repeated measure. So we do it the first session, the third session and the last session in order to track um, change over time. And so we could see symptom reduction through that. There's like a, a numerical formula. And then we can compare that our students reduction to any other university in the country or all the universities in the country. So we, we know from like our repeated measures testing that um, we're able to see uh, a decline in anxiety, depression, um, and what level that students decline, uh, reduce, I should say decline, reduce compared to other universities. Hi, thank you so much for your good work on this campus. And I want to thank you for the uh, resource sheets you provide for faculty if we witness uh, a crisis with a student in class. I don't know if you wrote that, but it's so, so helpful. Uh, I always seek to acknowledge in my classes the anxiety they may be feeling. It, because of broader societal trends. And I find that does work well in terms of building trust. So I, I ask students, what is hard about being alive right now? Uh, what is beautiful being alive right now? And how do you contribute to healing the world? And though they do that in small groups. I don't hear their answers. I give them the privacy. Uh, and that does seem to really help to acknowledge uh, that they're living in really troubling times, uh, but they can't always access therapy around it. So I just try to build it into my classroom where we're all supporting each other. Um, do you recommend that, that we try to use our classroom atmosphere, the teaching environment as a support system um, we're not mental health professionals and their peers are not mental health professionals, but it's just one other kind of tool that they could use, or do you think that that is too risky? Well, <laughs> to back up a little bit, so, well, one, a resource. Um, we do offer a, a training called QPR, Question Persuade Refer, that anyone can take. You can request it for um, any departments that you're a part of, you can request it for a class. Anybody can take QPR, so you can absolutely request it and learn how to have those conversations with students um, and how to get them access to care. Um, 
you cannot plant the notion of suicide in someone's mind, um, though safety and having a conversation is important. And maybe that's where like the individual different settings and the culture of the setting um, becomes much more apparent. Um, mind you, I lead with, uh, you know, I guess you call it challenge by choice. Um, I think there might be a, a different way of, of saying that nowadays. Um, so you can't plant the idea and creating some supportive structures to, to invite conversation is great. Although providing them with the tools, if you need further support, that's going to be even more important. And if you don't feel comfortable sharing, there are confidential resources in which you can share and talk about these things. Um, Dr. Volkman gives wonderful presentations on something called positive psychology. And it's absolutely wonderful because it, it builds on those strengths and those amazing things that are happening in students' lives. And so I absolutely support talking about things that are exciting for a student so that they remember and bring to the top of their mind how wonderful things can be, um, not necessarily disregarding the pain that's there, but all the, also the good things that coexist. Yeah, I, I would also just add, like, I, thank you for bringing those topics up with students. I think that uh, for a lot of students, if we don't acknowledge it, they still feel it's going on. Um, I also, I'm a huge proponent of a wellness community. Like, we can't be the holders of wellness. Like, I, I look out here and I see, like, I, I don't want to miss anyone, but like CDI, Dean of Students, K Spiritual Life, uh, ASAC, faculty, like this is going to be a community effort if we're really going to be able to support students. And so any way we can integrate wellness into all the work that we do is, is I think, going to be helpful for the student population. So community to me, a wellness community is something that's uh, very important if we're going to succeed in, in sort of adequately supporting the generation that we're working with at university. I think maybe we have time for one more question so we can wrap up um, on time here. Hi. Hi, my name is Alyssa Best. I'm a career advisor in the Career Center, and I also am an adjunct instructor teaching career courses um, that, through an appointment with the School of Education. I, um, I initially had a different question, but I did want to speak to um, a wellness technique that I use in the in the classroom. I've been teaching several years, and this past semester, I so the class I teach, we meet typically on Wednesday afternoons at 2.30, which is the time of day when it's people the sleepiest, <laughs> and it's the time of the week when people are the sleepiest. So um, consistently this semester, I started off the class with a one to two minute deep breathing exercise. I'm not a trained meditation teacher. I am a longtime yoga practitioner and meditation practitioner, but um, what I, I share that because we don't have to, you know, have a, you don't have to be certified to just, you know, lead someone, lead a class or in a one-on-one -on -one appointment. If you notice someone is really in overdrive or really activated, that is a tool that we can all use not only for ourselves, but with our students. And um, it's just to, um, you know, I would kind of have them do some light stretching and I could tell a really a huge difference. Also, I thought it was another great way to ensure that people would come to class on time because who wants to walk in the middle of a meditation that's in progress? <laughs> um, so that's just something to offer up to the group. And that's something that um, I will say to CTRLs um, to and, and the Ann Farner Conference there, I've attended multiple meditation workshops about integrating that. So that's something I've also learned from this, this supportive collaborative space of colleagues here. The question I wanted to ask was around the um, the social anxiety, and I'm seeing that a lot, you know, with the students that I'm working with, especially related to their career and professional goals. Do you all, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but do you have a sense that the social anxiety will level off at any point or decrease based on as people, as the student population gets older and they have not, like for students who experience a pandemic as an elementary age student or a middle school student, is there, I guess, hope that that they'll be picking up some more of these social skills? Because we're still dealing, you know, we're still not dealing with, but we're still seeing students who have, um, we're deep, I mean, we're all deep, been deeply shaped by the pandemic, but whose like high school education is, was deeply affected by the pandemic. And I'm wondering like, as they, as students, you know, as as sort of younger generations come up, will will that be affected, or will just the the social media trends and all the other trends that we, we that you all were 
we're bringing up just continue to exacerbate the social anxiety? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and uh, I, I, I think about this quite a bit because I have three elementary school students uh, or children. Um, and uh, it's, it, it's really unclear right now. I, I do think there's going to be a parental reaction to to the impact of social media. Like, I don't I don't know if anyone else has um, children around this age range, but there are parents that are sort of bonding together to say that we are going to enforce no social media till 18. And um, there's there's a lot of uh, push towards this. But it, it's been, a, I mean, in the elementary schools, I know in the middle schools, it's been really tough. Like the amount of parents, you know, if, when people know you're a therapist, they often talk to you and the amount of parents that have yeah, come up to me and said, you know, uh, my child is nine and they're saying they're suicidal or they hate themselves. Like it, it's just much higher than I ever experienced before. And there's also like, again, it's, it's really hard to get resources for students and there's a lot of turnover. There's a lot less stability at schools. Um, teachers are much more likely to leave halfway through a year. Uh, so, that, so I don't think it's hopeless at all. Like, I think we, I think that we will, we'll build over time, but I do think that there are going to be challenges that we see from this for, for quite a while. Um, last thing I just want to say, I know we're over time, but, um, I just want to make a pitch. Like we really need your all support, um, and work together. And, and I, you know, I'd love to have more conversations with people in this room because, um, if we're going to be successful, as I said, we need to have a community, but we also need to instill a confidence in the resources. And and sometimes, um, at least I feel, maybe I'm too close to it, that some of the uh, information out there about the resources aren't quite accurate to what we're seeing in the center itself. And so I'm just hoping that this can be, we can continue to like build community amongst all the people that are interested in, in working with students and helping them progress. Uh, so thank you all for your time. Okay, now I'm here. Uh, I always say that I get these funny jobs uh, where I stand between food and give directions. So I'm not quite sure uh, how you're going to feel about that, but that's what I'm here to do. Thank you all for being here this morning. I was lucky to grab the last part of that session, and I know it's been going really well. So thank you again. I'm just here to give you a preview of the afternoon and send you off to lunch. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that um, in doing so, we recognize Ashley and all those that have been here, Jeff and Bridget, uh, and planning Raymond here, everyone, CTRL, Anna, wherever you are, uh, all the folks that have played such an active role in playing uh, in planning today. And just, again, emphasizing the uh, the importance that we place on student success and um, that their well-being. So thank you for that. Um, after lunch, you have a full afternoon of virtual breakout sessions. So it's going to be great to be able to go to wherever you need to be this afternoon and tune in again to these. Um, there'll be four sessions uh, and the content's going to be the same in each time block. Uh, so you can grab two. Uh, so it'll be great. Uh, the four breakout sessions, there's going to be one on supporting uh, students' financial wellness, led by Charlene McDonald from the Director of Financial Aid, uh, Communication and Service in the Office of Enrollment. Uh, this session will facilitate understanding of financial aid resources at AU and the means for students to proactively uh, access them. So that's going to be a great session. Breakout section uh, number two is supporting students of concern, early interve interventions, academic alert or care reports. Um, that's the question, what are we gonna do? Uh, led by Justin Bernstein, the Interim Dean of Students, uh, Ash uh, Bushertrek, I probably said that wrong, I'm sorry, uh, Assistant Dean of Students, and Jimmy Ellis, Associate Dean of Undergraduate Education. You're going to get an overview of the academic alert and care report systems that we have and to let you know when you might utilize each one uh, in different scenarios. 
in breakout session three, student engagement, thriving through the eyes of engagement. That's going to be led by Asa Mack, Associate Director of the Center for Student Involvement, and Sam Eastby, uh, Associate Director of Fraternity and Shorty Life here on campus. Uh, here you're going to get to discuss opportunities for student involvement uh, and encouraging student agency to better balance their student involvement and personal wellness. Uh, and again, how AU faculty and staff can support students in prioritizing this holistic development that they're going through. And finally, breakout four, rebuilding connections, applying restorative practices to enhance student well-being, led by Jaris Williams, Associate Dean of Students and Director of Inclusion Support, and Kernisha Rowe, Assistant Dean of Students, Student Conduct and Conflict Resolution Services. This session, as, as it suggests, will explore the transformative power of restorative pr uh, practices uh, and nurturing a healthy environment and fostering meaningful connections and empowering students to redefine relationships. Um, participants will learn how to, uh, how specific services and resources uh, can foster, help us foster that sense of belonging and promote an inclusive community. So four great breakout sessions. Again, all four will be repeated in each time session. So you'll have a chance to grab at least two of them unless you're bouncing Zoom rooms um, and take advantage of those great talks. And thanks to everybody presenting at them and putting them together. Um, I hope you'll take full advantage of everything we have this afternoon. They're gonna be recorded. So if you have to miss one and wanna grab it later, you'll be able to, I'm glad to hear that. Um, and we're really looking forward to what this summit and our, our whole work together as a community is gonna mean for the success and well-being of our students. I love the community of wellness. I think we have a great start of that here and just leaning into that together. So I hope you have a fantastic afternoon. If I don't see you before they show up in a couple of weeks, uh, I'll see you then. Please do not ever hesitate to reach out if I can be of help to you. So thank you.